want to start this message this morning by showing you a couple of photos I took early Friday morning as I sat down to uh, write the sermon for today in my normal chair in my living room. Um, they're identical in a sort of kind of way. This first one is a picture of my living room at 6 a.m. I sh shot it from the corner by the window. If you've been to my house, there's a cluttered coffee table right in front of me with an iPad on it, the Globe and Mail, and some of Edward's stuffed shaking toys. There's a living room couch in behind it with a green-gray kind of uh, finish on it, two brown pillows in either corner. Behind the couch, a divider, uh, which then leads into the little dining room we have. There's a window there with a, a plant in front of it. There's three paintings on the wall. One of them my daughter painted right onto the wall. She's going to repaint over that this afternoon, a new painting. Uh, no, it was really good, but she wants to redo it. And then she's got a couple that are framed, and then one from my son Edward on the back wall that he painted in his special program. And then, of course, we have our fake hardwood floors, and oh yeah, there's a plant on the table right in front. And then I turned on this lamp and took another picture of the same space. One... 60 watt light bulb and it changed everything in the room. That's the kind of difference light makes. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, you, now he was talking to his followers, his disciples, looking them in the eye and a whole bunch of others, I presume, when he said you, but in the Christian church, we believe that he died and resurrected, he is now seated at the right hand of God, that he has breathed his spirit into the world, has somehow, in some way, touched your life. And so when he says, you, back then, he's saying, you, now. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In the ancient Hebrew Old Testament context, light was always understood to be symbolic of the presence of God. When you talked about something being a light or a light coming, it was all about the fact that God was there. When the prophet Isaiah foretold the birth of the Messiah, he wrote, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. When Jesus, as I said earlier, talked about the essence of who he is, he said, I am the light of the world. The light of the world, according to our story, the Christian faith, is God with us, with you, right now. That light is surrounding and may even be moving within you. His light illumines reality, lets us see things for what they really are, everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. When He is around, His light is so powerful and numinous and all-present that everything gets seen for what it is. And you see it all. When I took that picture of our living room and told Fran I was going to use that on Sunday because I have to ask permission whenever I draw the family into Sunday stuff, she goes, well, was it clean? <laughs> You know, I think that's the whole point. Our house is a mess most of the time. And my heart is a mess most of the time. And none of us is without brokenness and um, having fallen short. And we've all got secrets in that back corner, you know, some of them gathering dust maybe for years, maybe for decades. And there's a lot of crap that we do that is just 
wrong when we're online or when we're working or when we're interacting with that other person. A lot of unforgiveness, a lot of anger and hatred. Mine comes out on the deerfoot most of the time. I'm an animal. <laughs> it's in me. A lot of this, what the Bible calls sin. So the light shines and you see that for yourself. And when the light is God shining it on you, you fall to your knees and say, sorry. The light also clarifies other realities, who you are in the lifting up off your knees, what your identity really is and what God made you for and put you on this planet to be right now. When God's light shines, you know what time it is. You, you, you feel whole and a sense of peace and purpose. Even if the world is falling apart around you, you know that you know who, who made you and why you're here. It's like as he's looking at you in the light, you understand you in the light. In your light, I see light, the poet psalmist wrote. Blessed are your eyes because they see, Jesus says to his disciples, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And what were those disciples seeing then when Jesus said that? And, and what can you, we, see as he's saying that? They, first and foremost, saw Jesus Christ for who he said he was. Not just a great teacher, not just a great moral model. He said he was the Son of God. So either he was insane or he was, and they were seeing Christ for who he was and the reality of his kingdom here now, not yet fully here, and yet somehow here. Seeing the kingdom for what it was, Jesus said when he began his calling, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. The poor, right? Nancy's here from Malawi, going to talk a little bit later about some projects that we're coming alongside her and others with in Africa. Jesus said, I've come to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And favor in the kingdom of God is you having eyes to see and ears to hear his presence and his voice in your life and then find life as a result. Starting with you in your poverty of spirit. And those things that have imprisoned you and kept you in a dark, dank, lonely, not what your life is meant to be kind of place left you blind, deaf, oppressed. His light is shining on you, illumining a new world, a new way, calling you to receive His light and then in the miracle of the transformation of that be spreaders and speakers and beers of the light. Again, that passage from Matthew, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good, de your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
So the question is, are you seeing it? Is there any sense of illumination about this in you? Can others, when they look at you, <laughs> see it all over you? Do you become transparent, translucent in a way, insofar as they're able to look kind of through you or sense around you or see through the way you love and the way you listen and the way you touch and the way you give and the way you put your life down for your wife or your friend? That light. A town built on a hill can't be hidden nor should you want to hide something if that something is real in you and me. You don't put it under a bowl, hide it in a church, keep it in your office or cubicle or within your heart. You let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. So that his light can touch everyone in the house. And that was Jesus' inference in talking about a first century Palestinian house, which was usually one room. You lit a candle, you lit a lamp, everything. So what does that look like? Nancy will talk for 10 minutes or so later about Malawi and feeding orphans and teaching sustainable, transformative, community-transforming practices to people so that they can live and delight a little bit more and experience a bit more heaven on earth. We'll hear more about that in a while. But of course, your neighbor is not just Africa. Your neighbor is right there on your street, right beside you on either side. And your partner is your neighbor in this. And all of those artists are your neighbor your tenants are your neighbors. At the gym, at home. Another unique, I guess, to our community, although other communities are doing this, but we're really leaning into this idea of the light, um, is a call to be a light in the world and a transforming presence in every single square inch of this cosmos. All of creation's spheres, Jesus means to bring light and renewal and redemption and restoration to. He didn't just come to save souls. He came to save everything, a world. He wants to light it all up. The field of education, he wants to light up. That whole school at Bear's Paw, he wants to light up. And not just with Christian stuff, with him. He wants to light up how we do business in the city. He wants to bring illumination to engineers in the oil sands projects that are being built. He wants to bring light into your home through how you are a mother and a father, how you're a sister, how you're a friend, how you play volleyball, how you do your engineering, maintaining things and building things. Science, the arts, the environment, the worlds of sport and fashion and business, he wants to make everything new again. One of his disciples, sitting in a cave in an island, had a vision and wrote and heard him say, now resurrected, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then Jesus said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And even as we are called to be a light and transformative presence in all of those places we've talked about, I just cited, and more, everywhere. 
we believe that the light is already there, shining. Maybe not as clearly, maybe clothed in mystery, but surely an omnipresent God whose spirit makes and holds the whole cosmos is everywhere already. I mean, light is kind of like that. It doesn't just hit you, even though you perceive it in a unique way as a volitional, rational being. You can cognate that, but you can also cognate that it's hitting everything and reflecting off your whole room, house, world. For God so loves the whole of the world he made. And so we look for glimmers and flashes and shining beacons and beautiful stories, narratives of light everywhere. And we claim them. We name them as His. And by doing that, claim them again for Him. We do it by seeing God's innate created goodness in the world and the universe and in people, and we do it because the Spirit right now, just in time, is whispering and through our consciences, consciences impressing truth about what we're looking at and who made that, and God might be saying something through those things to you. God works in the createdness of the thing, and He works by His Spirit to give us eyes through reading the Bible, through knowing Him personally in the Gospel, to see Him in the world. To follow His light and to transform it, make it new. Everywhere from where you live right to Lalongwe and villages there. Last year we focused on science. That was amazing. <laughs> That was so cool, $30,000 grant from the Templeton Foundation to preach five sermons on science. We really didn't need the money to do that, but we found a way to spend it. Went to the Science Center, God's glory, and all of those cool places, geophysics. Co-preacher Mark will be up here later. Biomechanics of a human leg, the human kidney, large hadron. No, that was last year. So many great science texts. This year, focusing on work, which I think is even bigger for us and for you. I mean, this is a working city, right? And we're driven, and we get things done, and there's an entrepreneurial passion and spirit here. What, what's it going to mean to bring His Spirit to that spirit and try to unpack why this matters to us and why we love what we do and what drives us and makes us alive. A month ago, preaching a landlord. Did you watch it yet, Simon? You did? All right. Simon's a landlord. I preached another landlord. Next week, preaching forensic pathology. And where are you at work, God, in the job of a medical professional who has to just see the bad thing and bring bad news? A firefighter, a midwife, an electrician, an artist, an emergency room doctor next Easter. Because I figure he, Mark, and others in that field know what it's like to bring people back to life more than most of us know what that's like. So they know, sort of on the God side of things, what resurrection feels like. Never really asked that question before, but what a cool question. What, what went on in your heart, Father? How can we know you through the goodness of new life? <laughs> oh, I'm going to get mocked for that thing when I get home. Kids always mock me for my gesticulations. <laughs> Last year, preached on an accountant, on a mechanic, on engineering, on a Walmart greeter. Jesus Christ's light shines in you through your work and is already there in that place. What would it mean to know that? And how would everything change 
if it were true and you had eyes to see and ears to hear. So I have a week off a month for the next 8 to 12 months from the leadership team to write a book on this too, so it's kind of working for all of us. And not just how to be moral at your work, that book's been written, not just how to be ethical, not just how to be a witness at your work, that book's been written, not just that your work matters and you work for the common good of the world and somehow bring God's kingdom goodness that way, these are all good things, but to discover what it means to know God in the code writing process, the program managing moment to know him as you are doing your nursing, to experience God's truth as a parent, etc., etc. Jesus is the light of the world, the world and all who live in it, the earth and everything in it. In this community, uh, our hope, my hope, our hope and prayer is that we can join in and see his light where it is shining everywhere in his universe so that he might receive the honor and the glory like we sung in that song earlier that is due his name so that we can know him as the light he really is. Let's pray. As we talk about this huge vision of seeking out your light in all of these places, God, geographically throughout the world and economically in the business of our city and sociologically in our relationships and scientifically and educationally, and it is uh, way, way too big an idea or a goal, or a dream for us to hold. But it is no small thing for you to build a church and a people who love and worship and adore you and see your light wherever it's shining. And so we pray that you would, through us, individually and as a community, do this work. And through this work, change a city. Take Calgary above 3,500 feet and put it on an even higher hill. Take each person here in their place and lift them up just a little bit more. And let the light, light shine just a little bit brighter so that people could know you're real you're alive, and that you are God with us. Fill us anew, we pray. Amen.